Okay, so I have to share this video with a confession. This is my phone. It's, it's basically brand new. And I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes explaining to you why me having to buy this thing is emblematic of a really big problem. The original plan for this video was to have you follow along as I tried to get my old phone working again. You'll see a couple of shots of it later. It was gonna be a great journey, but because I take forever to make videos, I ended up sending my phone back to the manufacturer for recycling before filming this. But that isn't for lack of trying. I hung onto that phone for months when it couldn't make a phone call or play audio or do basically anything without overheating. It got so bad, the founder if I fix it, suggested I try putting it in the oven. We'll get to that. But what we're talking about here is way bigger than just my phone. One broken phone isn't the issue. It is the ever-growing millions of phones, many of which are still usable, and other electronic and mechanical devices that are piling up around us. So first, let's talk about the problem. Electronic waste, or e-waste, is the sanitized way of discussing the growing amount of discarded electronics, phones, computers, doorbells, TVs, and Amazon Echoes being added to our already considerable waste stream every day. To get an idea of just how big a problem this is, I talked to two people, the founder of iFixit, Kyle Weens, and Nathan Proctor from the U.S. Public Interest Research Group. Electronic waste is a pretty small part of the waste stream, it's like 2 to 3 percent but it is the fastest growing part of the waste stream in the world. And even though it's a small part of the waste stream, it contains a huge percentage of the toxic metals that are going into landfills. I've seen estimates that it's 40% of the toxic you know, metals that are in landfills now and is as much as 70% of the stuff that's going, getting put into landfills comes from our electronic waste. If you've ever sent an old phone or laptop back to its manufacturer, like I have, or participated in electronic recycling in some other manner, you might wonder why e-waste would be such a growing problem if we're able to recycle this stuff. Like, at least my old phone didn't end up in landfill, right? Well, unfortunately, none of our current recycling solutions are perfect. Far from it. The environmental problem with our electronics ecosystem is massive. There's no such thing as a green cell phone. It takes hundreds of pounds of raw material dug out of the earth to make these things. My phone took over 50 different raw materials, 50 different elements are in this phone. And when we go to recycle them, we can really only get 12 of those back. It's about 40% of the mass of the phone that we're able to recover in recycling. So recycling my old phone likely recovered less than half of the materials that went into it. And it did next to nothing to offset the vast environmental and human damage done in the process of making it in the first place. We are literally digging a mountain out of the earth every single day to manufacture the electronics that we have. The elements that go into it are things like coal Colton from conflict mining in the Congo. You've got rare earth mines in northern China that are some of the most polluted places in earth. The problem is that, as I found out, there were no effective alternatives to this process. After exhausting every avenue of possibility in an attempt to keep the phone I already had, I still had to submit to an ineffective recycling program and end up buying a brand new phone. So obviously I would have preferred to repair my existing phone. But why wasn't I able to? When my old phone started jacked up, my first thought was, I should try to fix this. I liked my phone, and especially knowing what I know about our problem with e-waste, I was in no hurry to upgrade to the hot newest thing. But try as I might, I was stopped at every opportunity. In New York City, we've actually still got quite a few device repair shops, which is definitely not the case everywhere. But despite taking that phone around to three different locations, everyone refused to fix it. In fact, several tried to just get me to buy a new phone right there. One tech actually told me that he would fix it if we were friends, but couldn't do it for a customer. This is a great example of what happens when you're in an authorized situation. The authorized contract that you sign limits, it says you're going to do these few repairs at these prices and that's it, you can't negotiate. We're going to sell you the part for this, you're going to do the service for that, and, and that's it. It's a, it's a very focused lens of repair, which is fine and it works in, in context, but when that's the only option, then it really constrains the economic environment. But the moment that you decide to be authorized with any company, you're signing a contract with them and and, and all of a sudden you're passing control, you're passing the, the decision about how you're going to run your life, how you're going to run your business over to that company. So yeah, the Apples and Googles of the world prefer the system of authorizing independent repair shops to perform certain repairs because it allows for them to keep tight control of exactly which components can be repaired and replaced and how. This ensures that anyone whose phone has an issue outside of this small set of authorized repairs will be forced to upgrade, and that more perfectly good phones end up in the trash. The best thing for the environment is to fix and reuse the stuff that we've already made for as long as possible. But the companies that make this stuff, they've decided that they wanna to try to monopolize the repair market and use their control to dictate what gets fixed and on what schedule and when things just don't get fixed. Right now we have a system where if I wanted to do something differently with my iPhone, how could I possibly accomplish that, right? People buy a Ring doorbell with a little screen and a microphone and a camera and a Bluetooth connection 
and they throw away a cell phone with a screen and a microphone and a Bluetooth connection and a speaker. And all these devices have the same technological capability, but we're kind of dependent on these manufacturers to tell us how to use them. And then when they could fit, fit another use or they could be repurposed, we don't have that capability as members of the society to do that. Corporate ownership over the availability of parts and information allows companies like Apple and Google and Samsung to shut out any would-be repair persons willing and able to fix things that the big corps deem not worth it. And their control and ownership over your phone's software allows them to brick your phone, essentially turn it into a very expensive paperweight if you try to connect a third-party battery or a screen not obtained directly through their channels. The repairs people want and need and should be able to perform are not impossibilities set in stone by the design of these devices. Apple and Google just don't want a world in which you buy a phone once and fix it yourself for the next 10 or 20 years, the way you would expect a car or appliance. I say expect because that's my big reveal. This same problem is seeping into everything. As consumer technology has gotten more and more sophisticated and more gadgets and appliances are replaced with smart counterparts, the same problem of repairability and corporate control has spread beyond just our phones. We'll talk about cell phones as a good example because they're in all of our pockets, but the repair obstacles that manufacturers are putting up is symptomatic across the economy. Overwhelmingly, appliances are lasting shorter and shorter periods of time. You've got manufacturers like LG and Samsung putting tablets in their refrigerators, but then they only make software updates available for the tablet in your refrigerator for a year or two. You're like, wait a second. I thought my appliance was supposed to last 10 years, 15 years. They don't uh, last as long as they used to. And as they add more sophisticated electronics into these things, they're not making the schematics that repair technicians need to be able to repair them in a cost-effective manner available. And so you'll have a service call and they'll come out and say, well, we can maybe get the, uh, the new replacement board for your refrigerator, but it's going to cost as much as a new fridge. That shouldn't be the case. It's probably a little tiny resistor on the board, but they don't make the schematics available to these technicians to be able to do more sophisticated repairs all the way over to farming where tractors are getting more sophisticated. They have electronics in them. They've got touch screens. John Deere has decided to use this as an opportunity to cut farmers out of the equation and say, hey, we know that you've been repairing your farm equipment forever, but we're not going to let you do that anymore. Yes, you heard that right. Tractors. My friend Curtis shot this footage on his family farm to show just how sophisticated farm equipment has become in recent years. What was once done by much smaller machines or even horses is now done by massive machines like this. They're robotic. They use GPS. They have touch screens control and operating systems, not exactly what the average person pictures when they hear the word tractor. And the people who make this equipment, companies like John Deere, are leveraging their tight control over their proprietary systems to shut out farmers from repairing their own equipment and to drive the same wasteful cycles as the tech industry. So there are many farmers where they can fix the transmission in their F-150, but they couldn't fix that same transmission problem in their John Deere tractor. This makes life very difficult for farmers who, as a function of their work, live extremely far away from the nearest repair centers. On top of being nickel and dime for simple repairs they used to be able to make themselves, they also need to wait for an authorized repair technician to come to them before they get their equipment up and running again. Still not convinced this practice is pure evil? It gets worse. The organizations who have been most proactive lobbying against right to repair have been Apple and John Deere. Uh, but there are others. There are medical device manufacturers where they are sending cease and desist letters to hospital repair technicians in Africa saying, you're violating our copyright by sharing information on how to repair infant incubators in Tanzania. Uh, this is kind of like blatantly unethical behavior that we're seeing. Corporations protecting their bottom line at all costs, including like significant human costs. We've had had folks who were in wheelchairs with kind of a battery control mechanism and they'll ask the manufacturer, hey, can I have the schematic so that I can work on my own electric wheelchair? And the manufacturers refuse to share that information. So across the board, what you're seeing is this digital divide, this inequality. And it's an economic inequality that is driven by an information inequality where the manufacturers have the schematics, they can do the repairs profitably, they refuse to make it available to anybody else. And then they have the ability to set the price and maybe they want to push say, of a new model and so they up their repair prices and it pushes people into something new. Our inability to repair our own stuff is reaching more and more into every part of our lives, certainly beyond just our phones. That both directly drives an ever-increasing contribution to an already massive environmental problem and hampers any attempt to try to clean it up, all while alienating us from the things we supposedly own and ceding more and more control over those things, and by extension, our lives, to corporations. And most people have just accepted that this is just the way things are now, because, well, maybe modern technology is too complex to be repaired. The average person might be able to figure out which screw to tighten in their dishwasher to stop it from making that sound, but might not be able to suss out a bad resistor on a circuit board. And even then, would they be able to find a replacement resistor and carry out the repair themselves? 
I know I can't right now. The missing step there is an independent repair person with the knowledge, training, and crucially, access to those parts and information to repair it for you. We don't need everyone to suddenly figure out how to disassemble and reassemble every phone on the market, but someone should be able to do that and make a living keeping people's things alive. I think uh, a lot of things uh, can draw people to do the work. For me, it's the idea that something just needs a little TLC. This is Vincent Lai. He runs a group called Fixers Collective that's trying to bring back the idea of local repair. But repair hostile corporations continually make such local endeavors difficult. A lot of what we do can be stymied by uh, not having the right resources to get the job done, the right part, the right schematic. The right schematic is especially important because that helps us with our forensic exercise. So without it, we're very, 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 very lost. Well, I'm thinking about an Apple product where Apple sends people to state houses to, to talk with the legislators to engage in that fear, uncertainty, and doubt, almost to the point where they're messing around with definitions that are not generally accepted. Uh, they would call repair modding. And I have a problem with that. All that we're doing is restoring the original set of functions and specifications. We're not amplifying your Wi-Fi signal. We're not changing the brightness to some ungodly number of lumens. We're just restoring the original set of functions as specified. And so that's repair. By repairing it, we extend the life of the item. We preserve its manufacturing energy. We preserve the design energy. We preserve a lot of things that's much more environmentally beneficial compared to disposal or even shredding. Think for a second about something in your home breaking, something other than your phone. Say you have a problem with your sink. Your first thought might be to call a plumber and have them figure out what's wrong and fix it for you. But maybe you know what's wrong, and maybe you know exactly how to fix it, or you have a pretty good idea. You can choose to run to your local hardware store, buy the parts you need, and fix it yourself. And even if you did end up calling a plumber, that independent neighborhood plumber would have access to all the parts and information necessary to do the job, and charge accordingly. If a plumber told you, I can't fix what's wrong with your sink because Sink Inc. won't let me, and then you needed to ship your whole sink to them to be destroyed and have them send you a new sink, you would think that's ridiculous, because it is. There are a dozen or more ways that companies keep consumers in a cycle of wasteful upgrades, and it can be hard to see a way out of that. Luckily, there are a number of lights at the end of this tunnel. It's important to remember that repair and keeping the things we have and care about in good working order is so, 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 so not new. In fact, the opposite is true. This idea that things are disposable is what is new. And really, that disposability is only available to those of us with the cash, time, and opportunity to buy new things whenever the old one breaks. This is compounded by the fact that modern consumer tech has conditioned us into thinking that once something breaks, it's trash. It's done that by making buying new, in many cases, the only option. The right to repair movement is about fighting for other options. The idea of right to repair is bigger than just requiring companies to provide the parts and service information. It's really the idea that we have a broken relationship with our electronics and it must be repaired. We, we need to get a bill passed. We've had uh, bills introduced. The European Commission actually did pass some very limited right to repair regulations around certain kinds of appliances, but we need this these freedoms to expand to everyone, to all of us who are the consumers. We need public pressure online lawmakers to get this done. It's interesting to me how quickly these things can change and how quickly consumer behavior can change and how quickly attitudes about these devices can change. In 2017, you know, Apple was caught throttling the iPhones when it detected that the batteries were worn down. And in a matter of, you know, six months, you know, they had gone from doing like one or two million iPhone battery replacements a year to doing 10 million iPhone battery replacements. People realized that they were throwing out phones that all they needed was a $30 battery. And that was not a piece of information that they had. So I think I wouldn't give up on the way people treat these electronics, but we can't get to uh, a community and an attitude of repair unless repair is possible. Even with robust movements and organizations pushing for legislation all across the country, it can be difficult to agree on or envision the exact practical solution we're fighting for. Luckily, the right to repair movement in France is giving us a much clearer look at what one solution might look like. This is France's new repairability index. The law requires manufacturers of smartphones, laptops, televisions, washing machines, and lawnmowers 
just those five things for now, to calculate a repair score for their products based on a list of criteria, and then prominently display a sticker with that repair score on their products in stores. Now, there are a number of caveats and possible issues with this plan. Repair scores are self-calculated by manufacturers, and while a French ruling authority oversees the scoring process, they won't be doling out sanctions for infringements just yet. Which means we don't really know the power and limits of this plan. That also means that scores may be inconsistent from manufacturer to manufacturer or device to device. In addition to the fact that you know Apple and Google will be doing their best to fudge the numbers in their favor as much as possible while still adhering to the letter of the law. But flaws aside, this is something. And with criteria like ease of disassembly, types of fasteners used, availability and longevity of replacement parts, and freely available technical documentation, it's already having an impact on the availability of consumers in France and everywhere else to repair their own electronics. For example, Samsung now offers a free repair manual for their Galaxy S21 Plus online, with pictures and everything. To get the same thing in the US, you'd have to pay for Samsung to ship you a USB drive with the manual on it. That's how bad it's gotten. This is clearly just a first step in what will hopefully become a larger process, but the potential is there. Think about the Energy Star sticker that is likely on multiple appliances in your home right now. The Energy Star campaign works because it helps people realize that not only are their appliances contributing to climate change by wasting energy, they're also wasting money by guzzling so much power. Once people realize more environmentally friendly appliances would save them some money on their electric bills and more efficient alternatives materialized, people made the easy choice. I helped make a whole video about Energy Star on the Hot Mess YouTube channel if you want to learn more. The same train of thought can be applied to the concept of repair. A sticker like the one being used in France gives consumers an easy way to see how highly, or not, a product scores, and make the choice accordingly. What we need now is a robust campaign informing people of the benefits of repair over time, a healthy ecosystem of available parts, and information that allows people to make more repair-minded choices. We need for there to be alternatives in the same way that alternatives to our power-hungry appliances materialized. The hope here is that bringing greater awareness of the idea of repairability to consumers will open the door to the development of an ecosystem of repair. And it isn't just France trying to change things. There are plenty of bills being pushed to state legislators by advocates here in the US and in other countries around the world. If you're interested and engaged, you can go to yourstate.repair.org, so california.repair.org or newyork.repair.org, and we have a little form where you can write your legislator. Or call your legislator and, and have them come down and, and show them what you're working on, show them the kind of repairs that you do. Our legislators are very interested in learning from us and understanding the problem. They want to hear from their constituents. They want to see the problems that we're facing. They just don't know because they're busy legislating. They're not fixing things, so they're not seeing the problems day to day. So it's up to us to communicate to them that this is a major problem. Some good progress has been made here in the US in just the last few years. Massachusetts successfully expanded law ensuring that independent vehicle repair shops will have access to the same information as dealerships. And in 2021, at least 14 states are considering new right to repair laws. But introducing legislation and regulation will only get us so far. With corporations fighting these bills at every turn, broad public support is required to put pressure on legislators and manufacturers to support and implement repair-friendly policy. Building a movement is hard, obviously. How do we get more people to care about repair? How do we fix, as Nathan called it, our broken relationship with our stuff? To learn more, I talked to Sandra Goldmark. She's the Director of Sustainability and Climate Action at Barnard College, and she also ran a series of short-term repair shops called Fix Up, the experience of which she turned into a book called Fixation, all about people's relationship with their stuff. Systemic change affects every single person on the individual level, and systemic change can start from multiple places and multiple points in a system. So I definitely don't think that you can just change your own individual behavior and pack it up and go home. But I also don't think that you can sort of sit around and wait for the corporations to do it for you. Because first of all, they're not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> unless we put pressure on them. In order to get more people thinking in a repair-minded way, we need to not only change the way corporations control the availability of the products to be repaired, we also need to change the way that we think about the things we buy and own. To that end, it's important to highlight that repair doesn't just serve a practical purpose. Repair can be sentimental. I think the desire and the drive to repair is tied to sentimentality because I think that sentimental value is something that we want to preserve in its highest form. So. That lamp that's been around for generations will provide a lot more sentimental value and create better memories when it's working. A lot of people want to be sure that the things that trigger their memories are in the best condition possible. That was the first thing I noticed, that it was not just like, here's my lamp, can you fix it? You know, see you in a week. They would put the lamp down, tell us about it, tell us how it reminded them of their mother's lamp, tell us why they were frustrated when it broke and all of these kind of emotional and social things that came out when they were just talking about really the most 
mundane kind of objects. It wasn't only like your grandmother's wedding album or your child's baby blanket. Like it was lamps and fans and toaster ovens. I started having this idea that like we all kind of are creating a little stage set around ourselves, right? We have this life that we think we're leading or we want to lead, a little idea of our identity. And so we build a little set around ourselves with our lamps and our toasters. And it made me realize that this conversation about consumption and climate change, like the sort of more technical side, had this other human side that was really, really important and that actually we needed to talk about both. There's a recursive loop here, thinking of repair as a way to get closer to our stuff. It makes the things we own feel more like they're ours when we're able to bring them back from the brink, but repair is also motivated by our desire to care for our stuff because of an existing relationship with it. So how do you get people to care more about repair? I think the answer is in a lot of ways. And also, to a degree, people already do care about their stuff. A lot. The type of people who come here pretty much span all sorts of age ranges, and we even get kids with their parents. We get a good mix of people who are here for the first time, like tonight, um, and like tonight also, we're seeing people who are making their fourth or fifth or sixth visit, because they're always finding something that needs attention, and we're always willing and able to give it to them. The growing support for the right to repair movement, the existence of device repair shops controlled by Apple and Google though they may be, and especially the flurry of activity around Apple's battery gate showed that there are a lot of people who, given the choice to pay for a cheap repair or to buy new, would happily keep the device they already have. So while we need to force companies to provide parts and information to the public, we also need to force the broader economic work of making repair a viable, vibrant part of an economy of reuse. That involves not just changing popular mindsets and corporate product cycles, but also, at some point, addressing the issue of labor costs hanging over the global economy. The major broad scale thing that makes it so hard, for example, to make the economics of repair work out, obviously, is international labor standards and the low wages people are being paid to make stuff in the first place, right? That's like the huge pressure that makes everything else down the line much harder. Because if I'm trying to pay a fixer in New York to fix a lamp and you can buy a new lamp for the same price or less because somebody who made it wherever it was manufactured was earning three or five dollars an hour like it's just like a huge imbalance in the system so one big big part that needs to happen is international labor standards consumer electronics cost so little largely because they are manufactured in places where the cost of labor is relatively low trying to get a device or appliance repaired in the u.s may end up costing as much as buying new because of that disparity in our labor costs like most things linked with the climate crisis fixing that problem is complicated so what do we do the big answer that is easier to say than actually to do is reduce consumption, improve global labor practices, and ramp down the extractive economy and massive growth mindset. We need to remake our economy with the environment and people in mind. And in that regard, things do seem to be changing. In May of 2021, the US Federal Trade Commission released a scathing report calling out the practices of consumer electronics manufacturers. But the more easily accomplished, and dare I say, more hopeful answer to what do we do, is like Nathan said, when people have new information that they didn't have before, like the fact that they can get their phone's battery replaced rather than buy a whole new phone, makes behaviors change. And I think a lot of people would prefer to repair what they have. We just need to make it easier to do so. If that appeals to you and you want to help be part of bringing back an attitude of repair, I'm leaving loads of links for how to get involved in a campaign in your state or country to pass much needed right to repair laws, as well as how you can find a repair collective in your area downstairs. Thanks so much for watching.